Today I'm going to introduce you to our Strontium 90 source. This here is a solution and to be honest I don't really know what form and how much Strontium 90 is in there. On the bottle it says something about 10,000 counts per minute. The detector says it's a bit more and the radiation exposure through the glass vial is limited. This sample has been standing for more than a month. Okay, probably much longer than a month, but this will be a quite important information later on in the video when it comes to the better spectrum. So. After seeing how harmless the sample looks, what's so special about strontium-90? Today we will talk a bit about the most obvious thing, strontium-90 as a fission product and possible health risks alongside the decay data and the spectrum. So strontium-90 belongs to the lighter fission products when uranium-235 or plutonium-239 is split. Throughout the video I will only refer to the uranium-235. It's one of the most well-known fission products alongside cesium-137. Its half-life is in the same order of magnitude as season 137 with about 30 years. Which means it's another absolutely annoying fission product that can grill you in small amounts radiation wise, but it's long lived enough to prevent several human generations from going into contaminated areas without concern. Just to throw in some numbers, about 10 petabecquerels of strontium 90 were released by Chernobyl. Strontium 90 is not as volatile as season 137. Through radioactive fallout, it then reaches the Earth's surface. So up to 90% of all strontium-90 can be found in the top 5 centimeters of soil. A glance at the periodic table shows that it is the heavier homolog of calcium. And as you know, calcium is needed for strong bonds. But not radioactive strontium-90. Unfortunately, its chemistry is very similar. As a teaser, I looked at a source where the uptake of strontium-90 in red deer antlers was examined. They found that strontium-90 deposited in the skeleton is involved in the formation of new antlers and that there are significant parallels to strontium-90 in human skeletons. If one were to inhale pure strontium-90 in any soluble form, the effective dose would be 3 times 10 to the power of minus 8 sieverts per becquerel inhaled or 2.8 times 10 to the power of minus 8 sieverts per becquerel if ingested. There are other values for strontium titanate, that's the compound in which the strontium 90 is present in old Soviet thermoelectric generators. I won't go much further into detail, this was just a brief introduction to our radionuclide here. Okay, uh, let's go over the decay data. Half-life 28.9 years, it decays via beta minus and in this case without associated gamma lines. So it's a true beta only emitter. These beta particles have an average energy of 195 kilo electron volts and a maximum of 545 kilo electron volts. Not exceptionally high, it decays into radioactive yttrium 90 and let's take a look at the LSC spectrum. We can see both radionuclides in the low energy range we have the strontium 90 and in the high energy range with an average of 932 kilo electron volts we have yttrium 90. Even though the strontium yttrium radioactive equilibrium is reached I will still refer to this as a better only source as the 2186 kilo electron volt yttrium 90 line has an occurrence probability of of 0.0000014 are not existent at all. The decay scheme for the strontium 90 decay is actually quite straightforward for a better decay and you can see the non-existence of any gamma lines associated with the strontium 90 decay. There is so much more to say about strontium 90 and actually about all the other radionuclides but this video series is meant as a brief overview. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.